So this week is a busy week for me. It starts off with a trip to town with my dad and his dog Buddy. We're going to pick up a new set of oxygen and acetylene tanks so I can use my spray welder setup that I'm going to be practicing on this week. I've also got some shop visitors coming down, some real special guys that you may know. And uh, we also got to pick up a package while I'm out from my buddy Tom Fleming. So it's a busy week, so let's run to town first, and then I'll introduce you to my visitors, and we'll practice some spray welding. I'm excited to give it a try. I hadn't planned on putting no corn out, but Granny says you need some. Yeah. So corn, tomato, and green beans. Yeah, it's a good place for a buddy. Yeah. So I've gotten a lot of questions about my dad and people asking how he's how's he doing they haven't seen him in the videos lately and he's doing just fine him and buddy have been hanging out at the house they've been getting the garden ready for this year he's been working in firewood a lot it's something he enjoys doing he's pretty much stocked up for next winter so working that's what my dad's doing like he always does So the first part of this video is going to be an introduction to, into spray welding and some one-on-one -on -one tutorial from one of the most proficient guys in spray welding that I know. And uh, towards the end, we'll actually put it into practice and uh, try it for ourselves. I've never done it, so it'll be my first time, and I'm really excited to try. So we've got some shop visitors this week, some that you may know. Got Adam Booth from the YouTube channel A Bomb 79. Hey everybody. Yep, down this way to visit, straight out of Florida. Came yeah. by to uh, see the rebuilt shop and of course visit with Steve and see the new equipment. Yeah, yeah. Give me some pointers on spray welding, kind of getting set up here to just, you know, the ins and outs, because Adam is, uh, is pretty proficient at it. He's got a Steve's lot of videos this, on his channel. Steve's got this awesome Eutectic Teradyne flame spray <clears throat> welding kit right there. He hasn't used yet, so we've got it hooked up. I was just going to show him how to operate the uh, the torch here and how to you know get everything adjusted right and use it. So yeah, he can put it over there to work over on the lathe later on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to using it. And if you don't know, use to build up sprays a metal powder through an oxygen and acetylene flame to build up worn surfaces like bearing journals and you know similar stuff like that or even hard face right mm -hmm. people yeah. use them for hard face and oh, yeah. boi boiler build up <clears throat> on the inside yeah. there's all kind of uses for it and they have a lot of different powders depending on your use uh, i use this powder here 21022 for just about any kind of uh, general build up use so bearing journals or seal journals that are worn or even if you have an area of a shaft that's just been rubbed and, and it's warm yeah. and you're fixing it, use it for that too. It works really good. Yeah, yeah, they have a definitely a large variety of powders. I've been looking into it, and uh, there's a lot to choose from. This mm -hmm. is a nice kit. I can't wait to, to 
to break into it. It's a very nice kit, yeah. very well taken care of, and it came with everything that you need. Yeah, it just got, uh, I just got it back from Eutectic. I had sent it uh, down there to Dave, and uh, he had looked it over as, at, a, at a courtesy, I guess, uh, to the channel, looked it over to make sure that it didn't need anything and that it functioned as it should. He said it needed nothing, and that he was so very surprised to see a kit of this age in this condition. Yeah, it was, uh, I believe it was right here, 1988. Yeah. There's a quality control inspection tag on here. Yeah, still got the still got that on it, so yep. it's pretty impressive. So somebody had this and didn't use it. They just put it away in a cabinet, and, and it's uh, preserved for you, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, yeah. They're they're quite pricey to buy new. They are. They are very expensive, but if you got to work for it, it'll uh, it'll pay for itself pretty yeah. quick. Yeah, that's what uh, Dave was saying, is that, uh, you know, even though the, the cost to get set up is quite substantial, the payoff on the jobs that you do can be quite uh, substantial as well. Because you, if you imagine some large shaft, you know, just the material alone these days to build, rebuild mm -hmm. that shaft, then you hire a machinist to, to remake it. I mean, you're talking lots of money. You have you reduce the, the downtime when you're doing certain jobs. A yep. lot of jobs that you're going to use this versus do a traditional welding buildup. Yep. You're, you're dramatically reducing the downtime. And the materials involved in, in yeah, doing those yeah. repairs. That's, yeah, I didn't in think about cases, that, but that's, that's true, I'm sure. You set your shaft up, you get it running true, do your undercut, spray it with this, let it cool, turn it to size, and you're pretty well done. Yeah. So it will save hours of jobs doing it a different way where you're going to weld it up with a arc welder or machine it and have to put sleeves right, or right. something yeah, on yeah, it. And, you, you know, the heat input, you know, when you're doing a turning shaft, it mm -hmm. may... Uh, reduce warpage versus arc welding and yeah it, you know. it it limit we have that question a lot is uh will this cause a shaft to warp and no it won't cause it you're not getting yeah. it hot enough to cause warpage plus you're, you're rotating heating it, it. Yeah, heating it all the way around evenly even even heat and you're keeping it below 600 degrees usually you never have to go over that yeah, yeah interesting yeah i can't wait to to learn more about it and uh and try it. We'll get it fired off here in a little bit and show you how to how it works. Yep, got the double tank set up, so two acetylene tanks and two oxygen tanks, which you don't necessarily need two oxygen tanks, but yeah. supposedly you should run two acetylene tanks to minimize the risk of pulling acetone into the line because it is a high draw. Uh, Correct. Yeah, it's a high draw unit. It uses a lot of a lot of fuel. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just a way to prolong the life of your equipment is to run two tanks. So we're set up there and hopefully for too long we'll we'll give this thing a shot. So the other visitor is Lance. He's down with uh, with Adam. They're camping in the area. Stop by to give me some pointers on scraping and help me out with the uh, large D-Wall mill we're working on uh, on the surface plate as well. Really the first work real work that this plate's seen since it's uh since it was recertified so, i'm not a scraper hand myself but uh, i am learning and interested and in, and in lance is pretty proficient and well, done quite a bit of it so i stayed the whole day in last night yeah i'm happy <laughs> i'm happy to have his I instruction may have to if i keep tearing up trucks like i yeah am. yeah <laughs> yeah lance uh is hauling his uh pickup behind his uh uh yeah, motorhome. Yeah, motorhome, and uh, had some transmission issues. <laughs> so basically, his truck uh, was uh, pouring transmission fluid, and not been a good day. No, but, but we are going to get some work done here. Yeah, so. yeah, I'm glad glad to have you. Thanks for having me. Too. Okay, go ahead, and open her up, and uh, crack these guys right there. So we've got your. Now, I know that looks high, but what you want is 12 on your working pressure for your settling. See how they drop it. So 12. 12 working pressure. Like. Yeah, working pressure. And then on your oxygen, we'll set it at 50. So I think it should be there. Yeah. Yeah, it's about 50. Yep. Okay, right there. So 12 and 50. 12 and 50. When you're going to be using this powder right here, that, that's going to change depending on the job, but if you end up using this the way I use it, 12 and 50 is yeah. good. 
Yeah, I remember the the documentation that you sent me. It was pretty pretty sta- you know the the pressures were relatively close on about anything. It seemed like yeah. maybe I'm remembering wrong, but yeah. that's what I uh, remember seeing. Is okay. a bigger regulator pressure pressure depending, you know, was just varied a little bit depending on the job, I guess, or the powder. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah, and I can, you know, we can retouch this. You know, we text, so it's no problem giving you this information. But, you know, being able to show you how this thing yeah. works and light it up. So, of course, you got your acetylene and oxygen valve right there. All right, this is your shutoff valve. So, when it, whenever you're spraying, if you want to shut it off without having to turn all these down, yeah, yeah. pull that back, it kills the uh, fuel and oxygen to it. Just completely. Shuts it, shuts completely it down, off. Shuts it down, okay. Yep, starts it completely off. This right here is when you when you flip this. This is what allows the powder to go down. Right, red yeah. is no flow. And right, red, that green for mm-hmm. a go. Yes. Exactly. And you only do you would only do that once you're ready to ready to. Yeah, once away. you're ready to spray. So you know you come down and usually what I do, um, you know, we're going to picture the shaft right here in front of us. Right. I usually flip this on and come down onto the shaft. Okay. Now that's the way that I've always done it. I don't particularly like to just blow right, it right, right. strike right on the shaft there. yeah that makes sense so I, let it stabilize I, just a hair that's right that before yep. yeah yeah i don't want anything that's not fully fused right when it first starts coming down to get on there right. so i turn it on and, and just instantly come down on it all right and then you do you just you, you keep it steady you want to do six to eight inches away from your workpiece if you're in that range you're fine and uh it's not it's not a paint gun i've seen people do this and they're and do this. Right, right. You don't want to do that. You want to. You want slow, steady movements, just like if you were the lathe cutting, right. a, you know, yeah, a tool like bit. A tool, yeah. So you just slow, steady movements from one end to the other. Overlap your end. You know, your with your undercut ends starts and stops. Overlap it and just uh, back and forth. And you turn it off. Come up. I usually hold it like this. You right. put this so right there on your the shoulder. Let that powder come out of the hop, out of the thing, maybe. Well, it's shut off, but this okay. this kind of reduces fatigue. Yeah. You know, so let, just rest that on your shoulder. The flame is going up. You know, you right. shouldn't be burning anything. This is not going to burn right. your ceiling. Right. And that way, you're not pointing it out at something. You know, if you're over here trying to check. Right, because it it's quite a flame. That comes it is. Out of it is. It's like a rose. Yeah. And then I have them calipers. Make sure it's clean. Your calipers are clean. Quickly check your parts. You know and come off there and, and keep going. So I think we're ready to uh, light it up on your flow meter, on your, your check valves here, your, your balls, 35 and 75 is where you need to be at. Okay. And you do that by adjusting these right here. 35 and 75. Yep. And, and all you gotta do, you know, you can put a paint mark on there somewhere, but yep. 35 and 75. Okay. And once you do that a few times, you'll get used to it. Yeah, yeah, 35 on the oxygen, yep. uh, 75 on the fuel. So how about we, uh, Light it off. Yeah, let's do it. This will be the first time, right? It is first, very right. first. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's going to be good. Oh, on your T valve, this is right here, the T valve and the mm-hmm. transport valve. Uh, we're on zero, and what you want is when you first start spraying, when you're ready to do your, uh, I call it the bond coat. When you first start spraying, right? Put it on five. Make a few passes on there. Mm-hmm. Come off. Go up to ten. Yeah. And then continue on. Okay. Makes That's sense. going to be yeah. your build up. Yeah, that makes right. sense. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's give it a shot here. See the valve, I had the valve Mm -hmm. shut there. Ball valve right here? Yep.
valve back. There you go. Shuts it wow. off. Wow, immediately. Yep. Now you can ignite that again if you want to. I don't like doing it because it hurts my ears unless yeah. I got ear protection. Yeah. Yeah, you know and, and, you... and some eye protection as well. Obviously, yeah. some some tinted shades. Yeah, you definitely it's... got to use. I think it's recommended three to five is your shade. Yeah. On um, on spraying it, you you won't be able to see it unless you use some shades. Right. And you and can that's use it awesome. Well too. Yeah, that, that's looking good. Yeah. Well, thank you for the lesson. I appreciate that. I can't wait to get some time behind this thing. You'll 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 enjoy it. I know you're gonna have fun yeah, whenever yeah, you finally I'll, get to do that. I'll uh I'll probably uh, use it quite a bit. Brand spanking new. Yeah, mine's. Did you see the mine. inspection tag yeah. from 1988? Gosh. Yeah, you can. Mine, mine's faded and the handles. Yeah, are a little we got the original it. case with all the accessories, crazy. even the the wrenches and stuff that come with it, oh. and a rebuild kit. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Got some extra O-rings. Yeah. Hardware point. pieces. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's a complete great. kit. Yeah. What's so, this piece? Of? That's for the lathe. So this oh, is you for your lathe, it. yeah. So you like can a tool post? yeah, you oh, can put this sure. in a tool holder, and then you can mount that. See, so it goes right here. But they got it configured so that you can uh, stick it, stick this on there like this. All right, and uh, you can mount it on the lathe. So if you were doing like a long spray run, yes, exactly. Yeah, if you got a the big, consistency oh, yeah. would be a, you, a really good as well. If you've got a big part that you're going to do a lot of spraying on, yeah, yeah, long the, surface. This is where this will come in handy, as well as we talked about manifold in the tanks there. Right. So that's all it. Now I've never used mine. I've always done mine by hand. But just so you know, that's what it's for. Yeah, I didn't, mine didn't come with that. So. And then when you're ready to take these bottles off, you know, you flip it upside down and just slide it right off, just awesome. like that. And you can see, we'll look at it right here. I want to make sure that's not hot. <laughs> I'm just going to set it right there. Yes. Yeah, and you see your powder coming oh, out yeah. right there. Huh. Pretty fine. Mm hmm Yeah. That's it, man. You got a good, good working torch. Awesome. So besides the spray welding tutorial from Adam, Lance decided he would bring down some of his equipment and give me some pointers on scraping. It's a skill that I'm going to need to refit this do-all milling machine back together once everything comes back from grinding. It will need a little touch-up to make it fit together the way that it should, and, and that's usually done by hand scraping the surfaces to mate each other. I hadn't used a power scraper up until this point, so this is actually my first ever attempt at it. And it wasn't too bad. Definitely the way to go when it comes to scraping. It took a lot of the work out of the job. And if you try to hand scrape anything, it's quite the job. So I'm going to be in the market for one of these power scrapers here coming up soon. And I definitely appre appreciate Lance taking at the time out of his trip to come down and give me some pointers. So I really enjoyed the visit from Adam and Lance. They're out and about, and when they come through this area, they wanted to stop and, and visit the shop. I'm glad they did. Um, we didn't get as much shop time as what as what we had planned, because Lance had had some issues with uh, his truck. But uh, we did get a few hours in the shop. I got some really good pointers from Lance on scraping. Uh, he's pretty good at that. He's done many, along with Adam Booth as well, done many of the Richard King classes. And uh, Lance has rebuilt several old machines of his own scraped them back into true, you know, rebuilding old worn machines. And he's also done several repairs for others. So he knows his way around uh, fitting machines together and uh, getting, you know, hand scraping precision surfaces back to true. He brought a power scraper, which I had never used. And uh, man, that's nice. I'm gonna have to find me one of those. They are the way to go when it comes to to scraping surfaces in. It just takes a ton of the work out of what is really a labor-intensive process if you do it by hand. So I enjoyed that and I learned quite a bit from him. Same with Adam on the spray welder. Um, I've never done any spray I've never done any spray welding in the past. In fact, I just got my spray welding set up uh, all together you know, the day that Adam here was here. So it was nice to get some one-on-one -on -one time with him. He's done quite a bit of it in the past, and he's got several videos on his channel showing the process from you know, beginning to end, if that is something that you're interested in. Suggest you go check him out and uh, subscribe to his channel, if you would. 
Um, it was really nice. I learned best one-on-one, -on -one, you know, with somebody who knows what they're doing. You can read about this stuff in books all you want, but it's really helpful uh, and reassuring uh, on a complicated process, both hand scraping and spray welding, uh, if you, you know, get some training from somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> so appreciate those guys. I had a great time. We, we did some barbecue as well uh, at the campground, and that was awesome. Adam is quite the cook. He's got another channel, uh, A-Bomb Adventures, where he travels around, cooks, shows you know, just what he gets into uh, when he's not machining. So it was a great time. I appreciate those guys coming down, and I look forward to seeing them again. So thank you guys, and uh, I'm glad they visited the shop. Check that guy out. So I'm getting ready to move my oxygen and acetylene setup over a little closer to the lathe in order to try for the first time spray welding or metallizing. Now I want to get a little time on that torch before I ever do anything important and I've got a shaft in the lathe that some of you guys may remember. It's actually the variable speed drive shaft that come out of the do-all bandsaw. I remade the whole thing out of Aquamet 66 sometime back. Had some deep hole drilling and stuff in that and it was not fun. Had I had this process then, uh, it could have been a you know good option for a repair versus remaking the whole shaft over again. So on that shaft, I want to try to see if I can spray weld it up and turn it back down. But first we got to move this setup a little closer. So here's something that's a real headache and it'll send you to town at least a couple times before you get what you need. And that's your fittings for your fuel tanks, at least here in the US anyway, from my experience. Now I was told depending on the fuel, the tank size that you have, you can have up to five different fittings for acetylene, which is ridiculous in my opinion. And uh, from my experience, uh, oxygen, it's almost always 540, depending on, you know, no matter the size of the tank, CGA 540, right? But for your acetylene, it can be a CGA 300. And in, in the case of this tank over here, which is the exact same size, just a different fitting, it's a 510. My manifold setup here is a CGA 510. So in order to use that with this tank, I have to buy a 300 to 510 adapter. Out in the West, they use the CGA 510, far more common than we do. And that's where this manifold come out, is from out West. Here in the East, we use the CGA 3, yeah, CGA 300. Man, it, it'll, it'll boggle your mind. But in order to use it, I have to have an adapter. And when I take this tank in, and then I'll exchange it for a full one. See, I own these tanks, I bought them, and they just give me a new tank when I fill them. They'll give me a CGA 300. And then I'll have to get another adapter in order to use it with my manifold set up. So, unless you're really up on it, man, it's a headache. But you'd think they would just make them all the same, but they don't. So some interesting info on acetylene tanks, and they're, they're one of the few or the only that I'm aware of that is full, completely full, of uh, silica and lime mix. It's like a porous stone, basically, through the inside the whole cylinder. And depending on the tank size, you know, gallons of acetone. Then they pump in the acetylene, and it dissolves in the acetone. And that stone inside the tank keeps it all stable, keeps it dissolved into solution, supposedly, and limits... Uh, there's not a lot of large voids in here. In fact, there's very few. It's full of that stone material. The old tanks uh, were... some of them were full of asbestos, but the new ones are uh, like a lime silica. These, there's nothing in them. They're just a hollow cylinder, and you can tell the difference. Listen to this one. Rings like a bell, that's an oxygen cylinder. The only thing in that is oxygen. And the acetylene. And no ring 
into that at all. So it's just completely full of that material. Now, I've got my lines all hooked up again. I'm gonna run around and uh, check them with some soapy water because I'm not interested in a leak because those are expensive. So here's a look at the old shaft out of the Dual Bandsaw's uh, variable speed drive. And really this right here, this small section is the only reason why we scrapped this shaft and built a, built a complete new one. It does have some damage here, but nothing rides on that area. Actually, there's two bronze bushings right here and here, and that's it. So if this would have been good, you know, we could have potentially not remade that entire shaft. So we're going to check it real quick with the dial indicator, and it's surprisingly good everywhere but right here. So we'll get you down on the indicator, and you'll see the wear that we're going to build up. We're going to be working right in this area here, and I think really that's all this would need to be put back in service. So let me show you the run out of this, and then we'll undercut it and get ready for the uh, metal spray. So up here near the chuck, basically you know, half the out run out. And I'm going to run over the worst section of the wear there, large radius on the indicator tip here, so it's not going to give us the complete bottom of the wear. But you can see it's 14 thousandths deep, just on this one side. You can see it goes right back to zero, basically, 180 degrees from the wear. And we'll run all the way down to the end, and I'll show you the end run out on this shaft. It's sitting in the lathe real good and straight. So, basically a thou, right? About 12 inches out from the chuck, and that's good. So, other than the one spot, I mean, this is a very usable shaft if that section gets repaired properly. So, there's a look at the tool that we're going to undercut this with. A shaft this size, we're going to cut down a minimum of 20,000. So, that's just a 60 degree, basically with a radius on the end. So that'll be our initial undercut, and then we'll come back and give this some tooth with a 60-degree uh, threading tool. Just you know, a fine thread pass on this to give that as much surface area as possible for that, bond, for that powder to bite to. spot there we got to uh, to the bottom of the damage 25 thousandths so like I mentioned the light thread pass here manual recommends anywhere from 15 to to 30 threads per inch and we we just did 28 so just a light thread pass to increase the surface area of the place that we're going to build up So 
So as far as I'm concerned, the surface prep on this part's pretty much done, minus the preheat. We gotta do that. We gotta bring it up to a couple hundred degrees before we start trying to spray weld on this. We've got a set of mics here set up just larger than the major OD of this shaft. That way when I come in, start you know, spray welding this and building it up, I'll be able to know that I'm at least proud of the uh, major OD, right? We gotta have something to turn off to get back to the size. So that's what the mics are for. That'll, just, that'll be handy. So let's uh, cover up this lathe, shield it from the powder, and I think that's pretty much it. We'll be ready to rock. So I'm excited. Kind of nervous as well. Never done this. So I'm pretty much ready to give this a shot. Put a little uh, shield on there to guard the chuck from that spray. Getting back in it, I'm not interested in that. And a piece of aluminum over the bedways and a piece of actually chalkboard. It's just the metal face of a chalkboard uh, sitting behind the lathe to protect the wall. So I'm excited to try this. A little apprehensive, but uh, excited as well. I'm gonna drink my coffee first. This year is pretty special, actually. Every 17 years here in the eastern part of the U.S., we have a swarm of cicadas that come out of the ground all at once. I'm talking billions of insects that are like this big. That They come out of the ground, they shed their exoskeleton, they develop wings, they flap into the trees, and they sing to attract a mate. They mate the female cicada, cuts in the little branches of the trees and she lays her eggs in those. Those eggs hatch, fall to the ground, burrow down, and then for 17 years they live in the ground and feed off roots and whatever. And then it, the cycle continues every 17 years. And this is the year of the cicada, so it'll be interesting to see. Um, imagine billions of insects like that big all coming up at once. It's, it's intense and extremely loud. You'll get, I'm sure you'll get to hear it. Uh, if they make a good show in here, they probably will. Once the ground reaches 67 degrees Fahrenheit, so I read, um, then they'll all come up. But until then, it's been a cool spring, so they should have already came up, but it's been relatively cool up until now. So I'm thinking in the next week or two, these guys are just gonna explode out of the ground and it's gonna be chaos. Everything eats cicadas. In fact, people eat them as well. I've never eaten one, nor have I ever felt the need to, but supposedly you can, and they say they're really good. I'll take their word for it. So look forward to that. I'll, I'll share that with you as soon as I see them start poking their little crazy bodies out of the ground.
good. So all things considered, that actually turned out really good, seeing as it's my first go at it. Um, that thing deposited a lot more powder, a lot faster than what I was expecting. I'm quite a bit proud. I mean, it's not excessive, but uh, a little more than what I wanted to put on there. But better, better more than, better too much than too little, I guess. Um, another thing I wasn't expecting was there to be oil in this shaft. You know, I should have you know, considered that, but if this was a customer job, I'd probably end up having to you know, cut this out and do it over because that oil is going to probably negatively affect the way that this stuff bonds to the uh, to the shaft. So, good thing this is a practice piece. So I'm getting started turning down this buildup that I sprayed on, and in the manual I read that they recommend that you shouldn't take a depth of cut of more than 20 thousandths. Now I didn't take a depth of cut that deep. I think my maximum depth of cut was like 10 thousandths. And you get the idea, nothing special here, just turning this uh, coating down to, to match the major OD of this shaft. They also recommend that you kind of taper the edges um, because it gets thin. We, you know, we overlapped uh, the masking a bit on the end, so we're going to get some parts that chip out and stuff, but that's perfectly normal. As long as it stays in the part that we undercut, uh, you know, that's the important part. So, and you pretty much get it. We just, uh, probably 30 thousandths over our maximum size. So, the buildup went really well. And, uh, I'll get it turned down here and show you the, uh, finished product. So that turned out so much better than what I was thinking it was going to. It was looking a little rough there in the beginning, but I think that's just normal. So let's check it. We'll check it right in the middle. This is an inch and a half shaft. Right in the middle of our repair. And we are about a thou under right here. Let's check it here. Now I just matched it with the lathe as close as I could, right? And then uh, just dressed it with a file. Right there, that was a wear area. It is slightly over a thou, maybe a thou and two tenths. Check it right here. Half thou under, check it right here. Uh, about a thou and a couple tenths, so right, that's good enough for for what this is for. And uh, you know, if a person really wanted to get super accurate, you could have ground that, but you know, that's not needed in this case. But you get the idea. I think that's a viable repair option. This stuff is strong too. You know, it just doesn't fall off uh, if done properly. Um, it's amazingly uh, strong. So there we go, man. If a person had a four inch shaft with six different bearing journals on it, you know, out of some crazy device and that shaft was to cost eight to 10,000 bucks and it had one bearing journal that was damaged on it, I mean, you could do this to it and save tons of money versus making a new one, right? All that machine work. So there you go, nice, I like that. So there's you a little closer look at it and it turned out about as good as I I could expect, I guess. Finish is super nice. It seems like it bonded well. And this shaft, I would not hesitate at all to put it right back into service. And uh, that's a neat operation. Been around for decades. It's nothing new. Uh, but uh, 
definitely neat to see and to try for the first time. So I'm glad to add that uh, capabilities to the shop. That's not something that you see a lot. And it's a great way to repair a shaft like this where you want to minimize the heat input, you know, not warp the shaft like you would with TIG or stick, trying to build that up and then turn that down. It's just probably the best option. So there you go. Looks good. Happy with it. All right, guys, that's it this week. That's all I have time for. If I don't cut this video here, I'm not going to have time to get it all edited together. I had a lot of other things that I wanted to share with you, but there's just no time. Maybe, maybe next week. So big thanks to Adam and Lance for coming down and spending some shop time with me. I really appreciate that. I, like a lot of people, uh, learn best from working with someone, you know, video. That's why YouTube is so powerful for me and for others and why I like to at least try to share what I know, you know, on film. It's just a great way to learn, in my opinion. Watching somebody else uh, is better for a lot of us than reading it out of a book. I try both, but I'm better working with somebody else, or I learn better that way. So huge thanks to those guys. Links to a Adam's channel, channels, he's got two, A-Bomb79 and A-Bomb Adventures, are going to be in the description, and a link to a link to Lance's uh, Instagram page will be in the in the description as well. So go check out those guys. I'd really appreciate it. You probably already know them, but if you don't, please go check them out. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks to my viewers, patrons, subscribers, and anybody who's helped me out to, on this project or my YouTube adventures in general. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. The birds fly south as the light leaves your eyes. Hold on to your dream. Oh, I know you want to scream. Since the day you're born, you're just a flower on your own. Waiting.